Well, good morning. I was thinking about this being the last day of the year. Uh, Kerry invited me to preach. Uh, it might be my last sermon, but I've noticed something. If I make it to New Year's Eve each year, I make it to the next one. Amen. Have you noticed that? Oh, I'm You'll get that about the end of the service anyway. There will be a New Year's Eve that I won't be here, though. Rebecca, is, is she out there somewhere? Or is she with the... It's been uh, almost 30 years since I preached to Rebecca. Uh, you're going to need this, Rebecca. We're going to be in um, the book of Second Timothy, chapter 4, last chapter... Paul's last words before he left this world. I'm so glad that God called Kerry back to, to Arkansas. It's just a three-hour drive here. If you, uh, if you come from Little Rock, if you come the way we came yesterday, we were over in Sharp County having our last Christmas gathering with my brothers and sisters, and we came across 412. And I noticed as we came across 412 and on my little Google map that it goes every direction from, it'll go west for a while, it'll go north, it'll turn back south, and there's a point over there around Huntsville or Hinesville or somewhere around there. It goes east for a ways, all the way back here, and it does this. So we got into Fayetteville, and I saw a street sign that said, uh, um, what, what, did you, what did you say, Belinda? You don't remember. I, I forget. I have senior moments. It was, um, well, yeah, Meandering Highway. You know that street? And I said, we've been on that street for four hours now. So anyway, Second Timothy chapter 4, just three verses that we'll read this morning. Verse number 6, Paul said, For I'm now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Father, we come in Jesus' name, and we claim the promise that your word will not return unto you void, that it will accomplish that which you have sent it to accomplish today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in about 13 hours, uh, we'll come to the end of 2017. And I thought that their, this message theme today would be appropriate uh, to admonish us, to admonish me and to admonish you to finish well. We've come to the end of the year. Not just to finish this year well, but to finish our lives well. You might be thinking, well, preacher, I'm, I'm too young to be thinking about that. Well, it seemed like it was just yesterday. I'm 70 years old now, and it seems like it was just yesterday. I was Carrie's age. Time seems to fly as we grow older. As an inspiration to finish well for a lot of years, for about four decades now, I have uh, tried to live my life in such a way uh, to keep the end in view that I might finish well. I preach hundreds of funerals down through the years and keeps me cognitive of the fact that one day that's going to be me. I even have a morbid hobby, some would say. I love visiting old cemeteries and reading the birth date and the death date and especially uh, the epitaphs on the tombstones that you find there occasionally. Some of the most familiar ones, you've seen them, gone but not forgotten. Loving mother, loving father, or beloved son, beloved daughter, asleep in Jesus, now in heaven but still in our hearts. And there's a little grave in the old cemetery where my mom and dad and generations of my mom's folks in southern Sharp County where they're buried, that on that little grave in that tombstone it says, budded on earth and blossomed 
in heaven. We leave this world, we depart at all different ages. I once read of a man that uh, requested that his epitaph on his tombstone be these words, stranger, as you pass by, as you are now, so once was I. As I am now, soon you will be, so prepare to follow me. Evidently, a gentleman passed by, and he took seriously that statement. And so he added two lines on a placard and put it by the tombstone and said, to follow you, I'm not content until I know which way you went. <laughs> Asked my wife some time ago, honey, what would you like on your tombstone? And she thought for a while, and I think this fits her. She said, I'd like you to put my family to put, uh, she, she did what she could. I think that was said of Mary. Our text today, Paul's writing his last words. He writes them to Timothy, his son in the faith, the one that he has mentored for years, his missionary partner at times. And he's sitting in a Roman prison in a cell, awaiting execution. And in verse number seven, he writes his own epitaph. He said, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Howard Hendricks, longtime professor at Dallas Theological Seminary, concluded that there's about a hundred biographies in the Bible and he said that two-thirds of them did not end their lives well. They either fell into immorality, they backslid, drifted away from the faith. But Paul was not one of those. He finished well. Finishing well does not happen by accident. Finishing well is accomplished by faithfully following, I believe, the providential path that God has laid out for us. This path will not always be an easy path. You've discovered that already, probably. Just as Paul's path was not an easy path, you trace his life from the time of his conversion to the time of his execution, and you'll discover it was not always an easy path. It's not the Christian life I discovered a long time ago. It's not all majestic mountaintops. It's not even the verdant valleys. Most of it's lived on the, I call the plotting plain. And then some of it, as Paul's was in the sea of suffering, in times of opposition and even times of loneliness, Paul was alone except for Dr. Luke here in this prison. Demas had forsaken him and gone back into the world. Others of his fellow ministers he had sent to other places to minister. And he was here in this prison facing execution. Basically, he was alone. It's a tough path sometimes. The path, the providential path that God has laid out for us. But I'm reminded of a very familiar verse in Isaiah chapter 40 and verse number 31. You could probably quote it with me. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. We used to sing that in the Christian school and put it to music and we would sing that. You know what? I'll confess to you that I sang that and read that for a lot of years, never did really understand what it was saying. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, and they'll mount up like wings as eagles. And I, I discovered at some point in my life that when things really get rough, God gives us the strength to just rise and fly above the storm. When things really get rushed in our lives, God gives us the strength to run. And I came to that walking and not fainting or walking and not quitting. What did that mean? Well, most of our lives is spent walking. 
Not running, not flying, but just plodding on day to day in the routine things of life, serving the Lord. And that's where, that's where the challenge lies. That's where the fa- challenge lies for us to finish well. We're likely to quit in times of just routine plotting. The great apostle Paul, being alone except for Dr. Luke, and he's in prison, and he's, it's getting cold. It's getting close to winter, and he's left his coat in Troas. I don't know if he forgot it or if he somebody. I kind of believe that Paul was the sort of guy that would give you the coat off of his back if you needed it. But he told Timothy, he said, you do diligent, do your best to come before winter and bring my coat, would you? Every time I read this fourth chapter, his last words, I, it just tugs at my heart. The great apostle, alone there. But he wrote and said, I'm ready. I'm ready to be offered. Literally, I'm ready to be poured out like a drink offering. I'm, my departure is at hand. It's near. And it wasn't departing the prison. It was the departure. He was departing the body that he was living in. He was about to leave this world and go home to Jesus. You know, the word depart, I found this very interesting word. It's a military term, I'm told, in the Greek language. The army would use it. It was a word that meant to, uh, to take down your tent and to move out. Departure. The, um, the mariners would use it to describe loosing the ship from its moors and weighing up the anchors and sailing away. He said, I am ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. So I ask, first of all, these four questions I want to ask you this morning. Number one, from our text, what kind of departure will you, will I demonstrate when we leave this world? Can you say, can I say, This morning, I'm ready. I'm ready to be offered. I'm ready to depart. Tuesday afternoon, I visited a man that I pastored years ago. He has cancer. Time here on this earth is very short. He had requested years ago, he told me, Preacher, I want you to preach my funeral. Got a call from his wife about a week ago and said uh, that he was not doing well, that he had cancer. And so I went to visit him on Tuesday afternoon. And before I left, he said, Preacher, I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready to go. Paul was ready. He wasn't dying of cancer, but he was facing death by execution for serving the Lord Jesus Christ. It was probably about two years before he wrote these words, before he wrote these words to Timothy in our text this morning, that he was probably sitting in the same prison and he wrote to the church at Philippi in the first chapter, in verse number 23 and verse number 24. He said, I'm in a strait betwixt two. He said, I've got a dilemma here. Having a desire to depart, he uses that same word again. And to be with Christ, which is far better. Now, I like that. It's far better. If that's not true, then uh, I've been preaching a lie all these years. But it is true. It's far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you, he said. Paul was ready to be poured out, offered as a martyr because he had lived a life for the past 30 plus years for Jesus Christ and he had lived it as a living sacrifice for God. Nothing held back, poured out like a drink offering, all of it upon those hot coals. What kind of departure will I demonstrate, will you demonstrate? 
I, I was saved. It's been almost 53 years ago now. I was 16 years old, and I was running with a, a group of young men, and, and we'd just flirt with death just about every day. Unsaved, going to church every Sunday. I went to church all my life. I went, was there every Sunday, every time the doors opened. But I was still at 16 years old. I was unsaved. We had a driver's license. And we'd just do crazy things. And it seemed like the one, that Sunday morning when I was listening to the preacher preach, God really got a hold of my heart about my lost condition. And literally that morning, I was scared to death of dying. And my mother led me to Jesus Christ that morning in that service at the end of the service. And I have not been afraid of dying since then, honestly. Now, there's been a few times I have been afraid of living. <laughs> you've been there. Many of you have been there. But dying doesn't hold any fear for me now. And that way, I know I'm ready to depart. The second question I want to ask you this morning, not only are you, what kind of a departure are you going to demonstrate when you leave this world? Are you ready for that? Secondly, what kind of a legacy from our text are you going to leave? Paul left an outstanding legacy. He said, I fought a good fight. I have kept the faith. Paul knew that the Christian life is not a playground, folks. It's more like a battlefield. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 that he didn't... Uh, he didn't fight as one that beats the air. In other words, he's saying, I'm not a shadow boxer. This is real business with me. And he had taken a knockout blow to the devil again and again. He did fight a good fight. He suited up, I believe, as he admonished the church at Ephesus in chapter 6 in the full armor of God that he might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. He told Timothy in chapter 2 of this same epistle that we take our text from this morning to be strong in the grace that is in Jesus Christ. Also, he said in that same chapter to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. I just thought of an old song, Shall I Be Carried to the Skies on flowery beds of ease while others fought to win the prize and sail through bloody seas. He fought a good fight. Have you fought a good fight? Am I fighting the good fight of faith for the Lord Jesus Christ? He said, I have kept the faith. My, what a legacy he left. I believe Paul wrote 14 of the 27 books. Now, you can differ. I think he wrote Hebrews too, but we can We'll not argue about that. But we know he wrote 13 of those. God used him to write 13. About half of the books of the New Testament, we know he, God used him. And the legacy that he has left that we have enjoyed down through these centuries and we're still enjoying today what he left with us here. He said, I've kept the faith. If I were to take a poll this morning among you, and ask who was the most prominent, influential person in the history of the Christian church, you would probably vote for Paul the Apostle. I would. What a legacy that he left. Also, on Tuesday afternoon, I attended the funeral of a gentleman that I pastored for 14 and a half years. And I noticed at the bottom of his obituary was written these words, the legacy of a man is not what he leaves with you, but what he leaves within you. Unlike Paul, I, I don't have a lot maybe to leave with you, but I hope that I have something to leave within you and to something that I have left within the hearts of men and women and boys and girls and people that God has privileged me to minister to down through the years. I don't want, I don't desire my name to be written on a building somewhere. I don't knock that. I don't 
really, I don't want my name to be, have a title of pastor emeritus, and I certainly don't knock that for some that have served a church for decades in one place. I'm not knocking it at all. But folks, listen to me. I don't want the only evidence that Jay Weaver was here on this earth is to see my name written on a tombstone in some cemetery somewhere. I want to write it upon as many hearts as I can. I would love to leave a legacy within you. I want to finish well. I guess the older I get and the closer I come to that time of my departure, I get a little more fearful, Lord. Am I going to finish well? Am I going to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord? The third thing I want to ask you is, what kind of a race will you run? I'd like to turn to the book of Hebrews, last verse of chapter 11, and the first two verses of chapter 12, they go together. There was no chapter divisions in the original text. Chapter 12 begins with wherefore, Maybe in your virgin is therefore. I've always said when you find a wherefore or a therefore, you need to find out what it's there for. It is connecting two things. About 35 years ago, in studying the, the 11th and the 12th chapter of Hebrews, I really discovered what kind of race the Christian life is. It wasn't at all what I had thought it was. I want to say this, it's not a sprint. I want to say this, and this may shock you, it's not even a marathon. But as we read these verses, notice, verse 40 says, God having, after he has given us all of the heroes of the faith and their faithfulness and how they have run their race, he said, God having provided some better thing for us that they without us are not made perfect or complete. In other words, you're saying we've got something to add to them that are still here, that are still running. And he said, wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. The picture is this. In our text today, you see the military terms and the athletic terms that are being used here, and here's an athletic term. Wherefore, seeing we are Compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, they've gone on before us in essence. They're in the great stadium, and they are the spectators now, if you will, and they're the ones that are cheering us on, if you will. Let us lay aside every weight and sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience or perseverance, endurance, the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Let me say this. It's a relay race. I want to connect it. They, without us, are not complete, are not perfect. And then he went on to admonish the Hebrew Christians that were there, running the race at that time, to run it with perseverance, with endurance. And let me say this about it too. Simply coming to the end of our life does not mean that we have finished our course. Finishing our course is having run faithfully the path that God laid out for us. Let us run our race with perseverance. 
He said, Preacher, I, I, I've gotten off the track. There's probably not a one of us here that's been saved very long and wouldn't say that we hadn't gotten off the path for a while. Well, let me just say this. If you have, then get right back on it. Finish our course is faithfully running the race, the course that God has laid out for us. Actually, it's just one leg of a relay. My life, your life, is just one leg of a relay race. We run our leg of the race, and then we hand off the baton to the next runner. Without us, they're not complete. The race is not over. One generation is to be faithful and run their leg of the race and then hand off the baton to the next generation. There's so many things I have noticed that the devil throws at us to trip us up in our race. I've noticed in this text in Hebrews that it, it, if we're going to finish well and finish our race, our leg of the race well, it, it, it doesn't require people. We look to those that have gone before and we look to those that are running with us at this time. Let me ask you, are you a cheerleader or are you a naysayer? Are you cheering your fellow runners on or are you picking them apart? It requires purity. He said, lay aside every sin, every weight even. And it definitely, he said, run it with patience, with perseverance. It requires perseverance. You just keep running until you have finished your course. Another thing I've noticed that the devil uses to try to trip us up in this relay race is he tries to divide the generations. You ever notice this? One generation says, well, they don't run like we do. Curious generation, they don't run like my generation. Or curious generation says, well, dad's generation, they just... I just need to quit running. Or, you know, it, it goes both ways, I've noticed. You're looking at a 70-year-old man that's all but just given up his preferences for the cause of Christ. We need to get over our preferences and cheer one another on in the race and join together each generation faithfully passing it on to the next generation. We've probably got three or four generations right here in this room today. Let's run it. Let's finish our course. What kind of race are you going to run? Am I going to run? And then last of all, and I promise this is it, but I'll remind you that even Paul said finally sometimes, and he didn't quit, but what kind of reward? From our text this morning, what kind of reward will you receive? Paul said, henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of, of righteousness, and not to me only, but to all those that also that love his appearing. Rewards that a believer can receive at the judgment seat of Christ in the New Testament that are likened unto crowns. There's five of them. We won't go into any detail, but there's the incorruptible or the imperishable crown. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, there's the crown of rejoicing in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. I like to call that the soul winner's crown. Paul said that they were his crown of rejoicing, those that he had ministered to and had helped to bring to Jesus Christ. And if we have helped in any way to bring somebody to Jesus Christ, there's a crown there for us, a crown of rejoicing. And then there's the crown of life. Revelation chapter 2 describes it as the martyr's crown. You say, preacher, I'd just soon not get that one. You know, I'll vote for that too. 
But the crown of life is described in a dual way. In James chapter 1, it says it's also given to those who face temptation or trials and faithfully overcome those trials. The crown of life. There is the, uh, I've skipped one, somewhere the crown of glory. And you, some of you can't get this crown. You say, why, preacher? Because it's the faithful pastor's crown, and God didn't call all of you, all of you to pastor. You say, but, but, but God, why did you? Well, unless you've been a pastor, you won't realize why God gave a special crown to faithful pastors. Okay, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, but the other four, help yourself. But why did Paul say the crown of righteousness is laid up for me? You look at his life and you say, well, Paul, he's qualified for all five of them, and I think he will get all five of them. But at the close of his life, the last words that he wrote and the crown that he spoke of and the reward that he spoke of is the crown of righteousness. Why did Paul use that crown? It's for those that love the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ that are looking to his coming, his second coming. A special crown. Let me try to connect this as to why I think why. Paul, in every book that he wrote, he mentioned the second coming of Jesus. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, he wrote about it extensively. In Titus 2 verse 13, he says, looking for that blessed hope and that glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We should live our lives in view of the second coming of Jesus Christ. If we do, we'll live our lives in such a way is to not only win the crown of righteousness, but we're likely to live it in such a way that we will win the other crowns. First John chapter 3, the first verses in that chapter says, It does not yet, beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. And every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. Live your life in view of the second coming of Jesus Christ. And I believe the second coming of Christ is imminent. That does not mean it's immediate. It may be immediate, but it is imminent. And if you live your life in view of the imminent return of Jesus Christ, you are likely to live it in such a way that you'll finish well. There's laid up for me, he said, the crown of righteousness. If we live our lives in view of the second coming, I repeat, we will win the crown of righteousness and likely the others as well. What kind of reward will I receive? You may be saying, preacher, I'm just not into this reward thing. Well, you ought to be. You know why? The last verses I'll read is from Revelation chapter 4. We see the 24 elders. I believe they represent the Old Testament saints and the New Testament saints. That's my personal view, but it doesn't matter. They, They fall down before Jesus Christ is on the throne And they worship him, verse number 10, chapter 4, that lives forever and ever. And they cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Any crowns, any rewards that our lives want us receiving, one day 
we will bow down like those four and twenty elders bow down, and we'll cast our crowns at the feet of the only one that is worthy. I don't want to stand before Jesus Christ as it is described being ashamed, red-faced literally, because I had nothing. I had no crown. I had no reward. My lack of faithfulness did not warrant me having anything to cast at the feet of the only one that is worthy. You ought to be. I ought to be into the crown business just for that. Not because, and you won't when you get there, say, oh, look at me. Look at all the crowns on my head. <laughs> He's the one that is worthy. The only one. We will bow down and worship and cast our crowns at his feet. Are you ready to depart? You young folks, you saying, preacher, I'm young. I've got my whole life before me. Well, I'm old, and I have my whole life before me, too. I don't know how long it is, and you don't know how long yours is. Mine may be longer than yours. I preached a 14-year-old boy's funeral years ago, riding his four-wheeler, flipped over, broke his neck. I was so glad that years earlier I had won him to Christ in vacation Bible school. Fourteen years old, his departure. Now, 17 years ago, 17, 18 years ago, I preached at an 18-year-old's funeral. He fell out of the fifth-story window of the dorm, freshman dorm here at the U of A. Hit the sidewalk, 18 years old. When he departed this life. So we've all got our whole life before us. We don't know how long it'll be. We just need to be ready to depart when that time comes. We may not, may not be like Paul and know that it's at hand. I, I'd really rather know that it wasn't or not know. I'm so glad I can't see the future. Scared me to death, probably. Are you living your life just going to leave a, a legacy, at least a legacy within others that have touched their lives in a way that is eternal? Are you running the race, the course that God has set for you. The older generation, it won't be long. We'll be handing off the baton to the, I pretty much have already. I'm glad God called Kerry to be a pastor. Uh, I was careful not to call him. I'm asked sometimes, well, is he as good a preacher as you? And I say, oh, he's much better, and I really mean it, he is. If you've dropped the baton, you're right now, you've gotten off the track, you've dropped the baton, the only thing you can do, just go back and pick it up and get back in and finish your course. And how something to cast at the feet of Jesus one day. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes for a moment? The gospel in a nutshell, my favorite verse in the Bible is John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, you put your name there, 
believes on him shall not perish, but have everlasting, eternal, forever life. God loves you. He loved you so much that he was willing to come where we are. Even to become what we are, he became a man. Took upon himself the form of a man. Lived a perfect life. And offered himself as a sacrifice for the sins of the world, for your sins and my sins. If you want to finish, if you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ, the way to finish 2017 is this morning. Just simply pray a prayer like this and cry out to God, God, be merciful to me. I'm a sinner. But I do believe that Jesus Christ is your son that died for me on the cross to pay for my sins. And Lord Jesus, I turn from my sins right now and I place my faith in you and what you did for me in shedding your blood for me on the cross. Forgive me. Save me. And help me never to be ashamed of you, but to follow you and run my race with endurance, with perseverance. Thank you for doing it, Lord Jesus. Amen.